to me, one of the biggest skills that you'll need in GIS is the ability to turn tabular data that you might find off the internet into GIS data that we can manage, work with, and uh, manipulate and render spatially. So one of the examples that we're look at, going to look at here is the add XY functionality. And we're going to do this from scratch. There's a website that I like to go to here. And this is called the, uh, the Climate Prediction Center. And this has daily max, daily min, soil temperatures. Uh, I have references to these through my uh, external links in my Blackboard pages if you're in my classes. Otherwise, you can just go to the URL here up at the top through the Climate Prediction Center at noaa.gov. So what we're going to look at here is the daily maximum temperature in in the United States for April the 18th, 2021. And what we have is a latitude, a longitude, an amount, uh, an amount, an ID, a state, a city, an elevation, and a, a time or whatnot that it was taken at. And it's got a couple thousands of the a couple thousands of these records. And typically, when we turn tabular data into GIS data or spatial data, we need some sort of information or field or fields that qualify location. In some case, if we're running a spatial join, it might be a zip code name or county name or FIPS code that is able to delineate that polygon uniquely from any other zip code or county or state name polygon that we have out there. In other cases, it might be a list of addresses which we can run using a, a little bit more convoluted process called geocoding, but that's something we do on an everyday basis uh, in our phones, but doing it at a large scale is a little bit more difficult and a little bit more error prone because of the actual data that goes into it. But in this case here, we have a latitude and we have a longitude. And you can see here, this is 50.37 degrees. So you can see this is to the nearest hundredth of a degree, uh, of a degree. A hundredth of a degree is about 0.7 miles. So this has fairly good precision, especially if we're gonna map this at the, map this at the, the country level. And what I wanna do here is save this file, bring this into a GIS, and then essentially map it using my GIS, using something called add XY data. So I'm gonna right mouse click, I'm going to do File, Save As. And so I'm going to save this. I'm going to save this in to my temp folder right here. And I need to remember the name because this folder might be really big. And it's called Air Max GIS 2021 0418.txt. And I'm going to click Save. And then there it is. Okay. Now I'm going to open up my GIS. Now I'm going to go to Add Data. And I can add data from a number of different locations. You can see here in my portal, I can add data that I have stored in my organization, my NCCU, some, some landmarks I've been working with, um, broadband service areas, uh, some other people have been working with. We've got some students that have been running some joins and whatnot. But what you can see here, and then ArcGIS Online, and then the Living Atlas that has a socioeconomic uh, business data and whatnot out there uh, created by Esri and, and other folks as well. So, but what I'm going to look for here is I'm going to go to my computer because I haven't stored it in a database and I have connected to a couple of databases here. My GIS demos and this particular file here that we're working with that's created in support of uh, these uh, demonstrations that I'm creating. But here I'm going to go to my C. I'm going to go to my temp and I'm going to look for my Air Max. And since I have a lot of files here, I want to put it in order. Air Max 2021-0418. And you can see I've stored other versions of this before. And so when I add it, you can see my table of contents it says standalone tables because it's not attached to any point lines and polygons. So we have our standalone tables, just interesting tables that we found off the internet and bring into my GIS. And if I right my mouse click and click on open, you can see I've got a lat along and it knows that it's C CSV, meaning comma separated values. You can see there's some convolution here in the elevation field and some extra spaces here. I don't care too much about those because what I'm gonna look for is just the latitude, the longitude, the amount, maybe the idea. I don't really care about the state, to be honest with you. But what I want to do is turn this into a GIS so I can map these temperatures in the state of North Carolina. Now, when I right mouse click on this table, I have a number of different, now this is what we call a context menu, but I have a number of different ways, uh, different 
uh, options that I have here. And one I have is geocode, which is with addresses, but I'm going to display XY data. So it creates a point feature class based on XY values from the highlighted table. So I'm going to display XY data. And this pops up here in my output feature class. And I'm going to actually click a place to say it, save it. I'm going to save it in my GIS demos. Okay, so my X field is going to be my longitude. My Y field is going to be my longitude, uh, latitude. So X is longitude because that measures left and right. Even though we say latitude, longitude, latitude measures angular distance north and south to the equator. Longitude measures, you know, angular distance east and west of the prime meridian. So a lot of times we say latitude, longitude, but we're really saying YX. So in my Z field, I don't have a Z field here. I'm not going to use one. Under coordinate system. I can click a lot of different coordinate systems. So I can pick the coordinate system that I have here. And so looking at this, it kind of knows that it's WGS 1984. And these are some of the data that it's projected in. But if we're storing data in a projected coordinate system, you know, such as northings and eastings, I would go and select that. But what I'm going to pick here is this is a geographic coordinate system. I'm going to click World. I'm going to click WGS 1984. I'm going to click OK. And so I can click on this again. And I can actually look at the details on this. So this tells me all the details. So it tells me the semi-major and the semi-minor axis. So this is the approximation for the equatorial circumference versus the polar circumference flattening ratio. And if I were to click on some of these different um, some of these different projections, it would tell us the different measurements to approximate the size and the shape of the Earth, as well as some of the, the, the datums and coordinate systems used to uh, approximate my false northing and my false e easting. So I have WGS 1984. I could use the WGS 1984 Web Mercator, which is perfectly fine as well. But I, I know this one since I've worked with it in the past. And this tells me the output feature class that it's going to send it to. So you can see here, it's storing it in my GIS demos database, which is the default database that I've created for this project. And so this is mapped relatively. And so I'm going to click OK. And what I have here, look what I have here. These have all of the brand new points that I have here. Now I can change the attribution for these. And so if I click on properties, I can you know, change the color you know, to pink or whatever I want here. But we're going to get a little bit more, uh, get a little bit different. And in addition, if I wanted to, and, and I'll run this really quickly, but I can do a select by location. And I want to just find everything in the state of North Carolina. So what I'm going to do here is just pick out everything that intersects with the state of North Carolina. You can see a couple of them that aren't exactly inside the boundaries, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. But I'm going to go to Data, Export Features, and I'm just going to store this Air Max Data for NC. So now you can see all these for the entire United States, and then just all of these for North Carolina. And I can go and pick and choose these a little bit better. Because one thing that I might want to do is if I click on Appearance and go to Symbology, I can click on Graduated Colors. And now instead of my lat, I can look at the actual value here. Now, I typically don't want to do graduated colors. What I want to do is graduated symbols, because it's hard for me to tell these different values. But instead of my latitude, I'm going to click the amount. And so now we can see the, the different values here, where it's higher and where it's lower. And I'm going to uncheck this for now. But now here are my different stations. So you can here see. These smaller dots have the lowest maximum temperature. The larger dots have the larger maximum temperature. So that's under symbology, graduated symbols. And 
the reason why I might do this is because if I run this for the entire uh, United States, go to Symbology, Graduated Symbols, and instead of lat, click on Amount, there might not be as much differentiation in the across the entire United States because we're looking at Alaska and we're looking at Florida, so we have a, a much smaller range instead of looking at it for just the United States, uh, just the state of North Carolina. And under my symbology, under my graduated symbols, instead of classes, I can click on quantiles. So each, you know, each one appears the same number of times. I can use different templates. And so now you can see my smaller dot, and I can I can change the color as well. So now, yeah, so now you can see these. So these blue dots represent my major cities. The larger dots represent where it was warmer or high. The highest temperature was warmer than the smaller dots as well. But in closing, what I did was I just went to a website, downloaded it, turned it into a GIS by adding XY data and making sure my making sure my coordinate system was correct and brought it into my GIS data and create was able to create subsets and attribute it all in a few minutes.